Well, I am so thankful for the opportunity to, uh, to be able to preach this morning. You guys know that um, it's about five or six times a year that I have the opportunity to fill the pulpit, and it's always a pleasure for me. Um, I like it because I get to see a lot of you who, again, I miss being in a portable building or somewhere else teaching Sunday school at this hour. It gives me an opportunity to see all the faces across the Sunday morning, which is cool. Um, but for a more selfish reason, maybe that's selfish reason in itself, um, I love preaching because it gives me an opportunity to uh, have no excuse for spending a lot of time uh, reading, researching, studying, uh, praying, and preparing to do what I'm about to do. Um, you know, throughout the week with student ministry events and, and work worship things that I take care of here at the church. Um, I don't necessarily have 20, 25, 30 hours a week to, uh, to be sitting and really soaking in um, a subject and, and in scripture. And so uh, I love preaching because it gives me an opportunity to do that. And, uh, and I'm thankful that Corey has given me this opportunity and trusted me to do that. I also want to say um, that I am proud of our pastor uh, and proud of the leadership of this church uh, for being willing to tackle the sermon series that we're in the middle of. If today you're visiting for the first time, I I would very strongly encourage you to uh, get back on our website and download the last two sermons. Uh, this is week three of our series called Twilight, and uh, the first two, ser- first two weeks dealt with angels, and then last week Corey spoke to us about demons, and so t- today uh, he's given me ghosts, uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, great timing with a clergy retreat and ghost week because he gets to pass it on to me. Uh, when I think of all the things that I would like to preach about, um, I don't know that ghosts would ever have come up. Ever. Uh, ever. Um, and yet, I'm thankful for this opportunity, and I am proud of him for, for doing this. Some people may look at the, uh, obviously, the, the flyer uh, and the name of the series and go, oh, that's just another typical church trying to play on the popularity of a book series or, uh, or a movie series or whatever you might know it as. Um, you know, next thing you know, they're going to be doing the Harry Potter sermon series or Fifty Shades of Truth or, you know... Um, I actually came up with that one at the 930, so if you're going to use that, you owe me. And um, I was thinking about this. There's 52 weeks in a year. Sundays on Easter and Christmas, you could do 50 shades of truth the other 50 weeks of the year. Hopefully that's what every sermon series is at at every church. But but no, it's not just a ploy to get you here because um, you may be a big fan of the book series. It is appropriate uh, that we deal uh, with the topics that are being covered in this series because, um, believe it or not, the paranormal has become the new normal uh, among certain sectors of the religious demographic in our country. Um, There's a stat taken from a 2008 Gallup poll, and Jonathan's going to put it on the screen for you, but in 2008, just four years ago, 38% of Americans believe that ghosts or spirits can come back and visit us. 38%. Now, some of you are like, oh, of course, but those 38% are Democrat, right? Um, Or... You know, those, those 38% live in on the East Coast or the West Coast, or they're at least north of the Red River. We know that, right? Um, but, but I would tell you that, no, it's, it's across the board. And uh, I even had some folks come up to me after the second service today. You know, Nathan, I never really thought about it, but I considered it recently. Just, you know, what's, you know, just considered even looking into it myself. And, and I appreciate you sharing what you did this morning because you really addressed some of the things that I, was, that I was concerned about, the things that I was really interested in. Um, but if you think about that, over one third uh, of our own country believes that, uh, that we can be visited or haunted, if you will, by the spirits of the those who've passed on before us. Um, And of course, who wouldn't believe this, this growing interest? uh, It's being reflected in Hollywood. A lot of times people want to look at Hollywood and say, you know, Hollywood is pushing an agenda, or they're trying to get us to believe something that, or or do something, accept something that we aren't currently uh, comfortable with. Uh, I don't think that's the case at all. I think the best producers, directors, show creators, movie creators, things like that in Hollywood are very good at figuring out what is on the cusp of becoming popular or more accepted. And so they write getting out on the forefront of those ideas um, and come up with movies, whether it's Twilight or Harry Potter or other series that you're very familiar with. Um, You know, a few examples from television just in the last four or five years. There's going to be some pictures here on the screen in a second. And maybe some of these will come back to your mind as as you see the pictures. But uh, who remembers crossing over with John Edward 
right? John Edward could uh, communicate with people on the other side. Um, one of the interesting facts I learned about this is, uh, not unlike any television show, he actually takes six hours of footage for each 30-minute episode. You know, I'm, I think I could get about one out of 12 right, don't you? I mean, every once in a while, you're going to get it right just by luck. So, but uh, I thought that was interesting. Um, another contemporary of his was Sylvia Brown. Some of you guys remember, I don't know why I used to watch Montel Williams, but I did. Um, maybe it was the bald head. Um, but anyways, Sylvia Brown was a regular on Montel Williams. Uh, she was also a regular on the Larry King Live show. Interesting fact about her, one night while she was on Larry King Live, a man called in and, and put up a million dollars for her to prove uh, herself, if you will. Give her a chance to prove herself, and if she could prove without a matter of doubt um, that, uh, that she was legit or whatever, he'd give her the million dollars, and she's like, okay, I'll accept that. A few months later, she's like, well, he never came with a thousand million dollars. Next thing you know, a million dollars cash shows up at the Larry King Live show, and she backs away from it. Needless to say, Sylvia Brown hasn't really been heard from since she took uh, the million dollar bet and then backed away from it. I thought that was interesting. Um, other TV shows, not just psychics, but you obviously are familiar with Medium, uh, Ghost Whisperer with Jennifer Love Hewitt. Um, the Sci-Fi Channel has Ghost Hunters. Uh, it's a pretty interesting show. TLC is your so-called dead tenants in which they'll come and get the, uh, the evil spirits out of your house because you want to claim your house back for yourself, right? Um, the Biography Channel has a, this is a great, this is a great show. Dead famous ghostly encounters in which they, uh, they actually communicate with um, celebrities who've passed. Marilyn Monroe has her own episode, uh, famous athletes and things who have passed. I thought that was pretty cool. On the Biography Channel, of course. Uh, the Travel Channel, of course, not wanting to miss the boat, has both America's Most Haunted Places and a show called Haunted Hotels. And then uh, Court TV has gotten into the fold recently with their show Psychic Detectives, in which they match an attorney, uh, an investigator, and a psychic or paranormal expert uh, to bring up cold cases and consult the dead for closure and some of those types of things. Of course, television uh, is only kind of secondary to what's been going on in movies for years, and there's obviously been a fascination with the paranormal in movies. You probably remember the movie Poltergeist and the, uh, the whole line, they're here. You remember the little girl saying that? Uh, obviously, the movie Ghost, where Patrick Swayze comes back to warn his, uh, his wife left on earth, Demi Moore, and uh, then he had The Sixth Sense about 12 years ago, and who doesn't forget, uh, who doesn't remember I see dead people, right? We all ask, still a joke to this day. I see dead people. Haley Joe Osment launched his career in one of Bruce Willis's highest grossing films ever. Uh, on a little lighter note, my favorite ghost movie of all time happens to be Beetlejuice. Um, if you have two hours between now and Halloween, I would encourage you to watch this movie. It's great entertainment. Uh, just the five minutes of the Deo music number in the middle of it is worth the entire movie. It's actually one of the, I love that movie. It's, it's one of my very favorite. Um, another lighthearted ghost phenomenon, Ghostbusters, right? Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters, right? Okay, see, I can say that without even telling you what I'm preaching on you to answer that. Very catchy, right? And then, of course, last but not least, don't forget the friendly ghost, Casper, uh, who has, in, you know, invaded the hearts and minds of our children, just reminding us that the paranormal is not scary. It can be a very friendly and a good thing. And so we've obviously seen that there is a growing interest in these things, and Hollywood capitalizes on the interest that we have, even if some of it's very superficial. Um, but it does beg the question, what is the appeal? What is it that draws us to looking further into things that are supernatural, things that are paranormal? And um, some of these experts, as I say tongue in cheek, uh, have their own opinions about what the appeal was or what it is. Um, but they've come up with six things that they all pretty much agree on uh, could be the most likely reasons why it's becoming so popular. The first is an invasion of Eastern philosophy. This goes back to the 1960s, in which case there was a lot of religious influence from the East. A lot of those religions and traditions are very focused on the afterlife. That's where you get the ideas of reincarnation and karma and things like that. Um, but a lot of that influence has now led us to looking at the paranormal and to thinking about the other side, to thinking about what happens after we die. Um, and so at least part of that influence can be attributed for the growing interest in the paranormal. The second is that people were burned out on traditional religion. You know, people come to church, they open their Bibles, and they look for cookie-cutter answers 
to very complex and difficult questions. And when they don't get those answers, oftentimes they look elsewhere because somebody else is willing to answer. We all know this. If you ask enough people a question, somebody's going to give you an answer, right? So if you don't get an answer that satisfies you, or maybe you don't feel like you get a good answer at all at church, why not look elsewhere? That's at least part of the appeal. Number three, some psychics sound Christian. Sylvia Brown, the lady who was on the Montel Williams show, actually claims that her abilities to communicate with the deceased are a spiritual gift. Now, I don't know how many of you have taken a spiritual gifts test or seen what Paul and Peter write about spiritual gifts. Um, I've never seen communication with the dead on any of those inventories or anywhere listed in scripture, but she believes that God has given her that gift to help those who need the closure, who need the opportunity to communicate or whatever it might be. Um, fourth, and some of these are, are the ones that I can uh, sympathize with a little more, but people want to know the future. Right? It's why we go see someone who looks into a crystal ball or have someone read our palms or uh, tarot cards or whatever it might be. If there's a thought that we can get a glimpse into our future and plan accordingly, then we may want to take advantage of that. The fifth is that we're curious about the other side. We're very curious about the afterlife. How does heaven work? How does hell work? How does, is there, is there a purgatory? I've heard that word before, but what exactly, you know? And so they're curious, and so if someone claims to have a knowledge of the other side, then we may go and ask them those questions. And then finally, the one that I probably sympathize with the most is a desire to communicate with deceased loved ones. You know, who hasn't been grieving uh, with someone, or maybe even personally, and had the thought or heard the expression, if I could just have one more conversation? If I, could just, if, if I could just tell them I love them. I really, I don't know that they knew that, you know, when they died. Especially if it's a sudden or a tragic or an unexpected type thing. I shared with the middle service today that there are times that, that I have this feeling. I mean, I'd, I'd love to communicate um, with people who have passed on before. One of the ones that I mentioned at 930 was Pat Wellborn, a dear, dear woman who served this church for many, many years. And uh, one of the things I loved about Pat was that anytime I would get frustrated, and yes, even people who work at a church can get frustrated at times, or you know, I just kind of get out of sorts and I need to kind of come back to center or calm down, settle down, whatever it is, I could always go to Pat, wherever she was, wherever office she was in, and the one thing I could count on is that she would stop whatever it is that she was working on. Sometimes I think it was something Corey had given her a deadline for, and Pat always liked me better than she did Corey anyways, so she would always pick me. Corey, would you agree? Okay, so, um, you know, it's, but she would always stop what she was doing, and she would turn to me, and she would give me her full attention, and she would just listen. And, you know, it wasn't always something that she had gone through, or something that she had experienced, or even something that she had a lot of advice on. She would just always give me one or two little tidbits of wisdom and knowledge that always meant a great deal to me. And I've often thought over the past few years since Pat has passed, just how much I miss that. You know, and, and, if, and if I thought, um, or if I were at the end of my rope and felt like, man, what I really need is Pat, would I seek out something like that? And so I, I do at least empathize and sympathize with those who have that desire, because I myself have had that desire. But regardless of whether we individually hold on to a fascination with ghosts and the broader paranormal, we can't ignore this country's growing interest in the supernatural which is why I love the fact that we've tackled this series at this time. You know, some of you may say, Nathan, I've never thought of ghosts. I mean, I've read books, but I mean, it's all just so fictitious. I mean, that has nothing to do with me. Um, can I just get up and go get the last few donut holes and wait until the offertory? Well, hold on just a second, okay? Because I believe that we're called as God's people to engage in the culture that God has put us in. And we need to understand that there are people in our, our culture, the, the poll says over one third of people that have a belief that, that they can be haunted or visited. And so we must address it. And I think it's very helpful and healthy that we look at what scripture says about it. What an incredible opportunity we have to speak truth into the lives of so many who are seeking answers to difficult questions. And what better time to look at what the Bible says about ghosts than 10 days before Halloween. Amen? Amen. All right, so this morning we're going to start by looking at, uh, at a passage of Scripture in which case the word ghost is actually used in an English translation. And I would encourage you to open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Uh, this particular passage comes at the end of Luke's uh, narrative of Jesus' life. It actually comes after Jesus' resurrection. He has just walked with the two men to Emmaus and had dinner with them. And this is the story that immediately follows that particular uh, story. But in Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 36, uh, this is what is recorded as happened. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. 
And they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Now, I believe there are three things that we can take from this passage, three things that we can know with confidence after reading just those eight verses. First, we can know that Jesus experienced a full body resurrection. Our pastors addressed this on many, many times. I remember just a few weeks ago when he relayed the story of somebody asking him, do you believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead? I mean, do you believe that, or, or couldn't a group of people just made that up and now thousands of years later, we're just, we're just kind of the prey of, of those who have kind of put this myth out there. And, and, he, and he says, without a doubt, I believe it. I mean, look at this story. Jesus didn't just appear to people. He wasn't just some type of phantom or some type of ghost. He showed up in the flesh after a few days after they had seen him die on a cross. We know that it was a full body resurrection and not some type of spirit visitation because he says two things. First, he says, come, look at me, look at my hands, look at my feet, obviously pointing to where the holes were left there from the cross, but also to say, look, I I have a physical body. I'm not a ghost. We also know they experience a full body resurrection because as a physical body is resurrected, that body will need physical nourishment. And so we have this funny little tidbit about him asking, hey, you guys got anything to eat? You know, and they're like, yeah. And so they gave him fish. And this says that he ate the fish in their presence. If he was simply a a phantom or a ghost, would he have asked for something to eat? I mean, how many times have you been seeing a ghost movie or read a ghost story and the ghost stops to say, hey, what's for dinner? You know, that's just not part of it. A physical body needs physical nourishment. And so we know that Jesus experienced a full body resurrection. The second thing this passage tells us is that the disciples knew what ghosts were. As Luke records it, he records their impression that when they first saw Jesus, they thought they were seeing a ghost. They thought they were seeing the spirit of someone who had just passed coming back to visit them. They knew what ghosts were. As you do more research and look into ghosts, the belief of ghosts, or at least the understanding of what ghosts are, permeates every major religion, every major tradition, every major culture in all of our history. It dates back thousands and thousands of years. It's not a new phenomenon, and yet Hollywood and TV and movies and everything are definitely making bank on the fact that it's becoming more interesting and more captivating. The third thing that we see from this passage is that Jesus understood what ghosts were believed to be. So not only were disciples aware of what ghosts were, at least what they were believed to be, Jesus understood what ghosts were believed to be. Because when he was proving that he was not a ghost, he said, look at me, come touch my hands, come touch my feet, look at my body. I don't have, I'm not, I'm not a ghost. I have a body as ghosts do not have. So Jesus spoke with this understanding and this knowledge of this belief outside of the Christian faith, if you will, of what ghosts are and what ghosts were capable of. Well, what is a ghost exactly? I think for this morning's sermon, it's uh, it's good that we at least define what what I'm going to be addressing, what I believe uh, Scripture addresses, and that is the question of what is a ghost. Now, I read this definition for my wife last night, and she told me it was very scientific, but nobody's come up and and complained about it yet, so I'm just going to share it with you one more time. And if you hold her... uh, Hold her opinion of this definition. Feel free when you're picking up your kids to say you were right, Christina. But um, a ghost is, is described as or defined as this. A non-material, phantom-like manifestation of a dead person. It is supposedly the spirit, soul, or astral body of a person who has not passed over to the other side, but instead has remained on earth after death. So the spirit of someone who has died, but has not passed over. As you get into kind of these paranormal books and experts and things like that, they describe either the the tunnel of light um, or a threshold that you have to cross and that there's an actual other side and that essentially some spirits don't go into the tunnel or don't cross over that threshold and they become a ghost haunting those who are still living on earth. Well, why do they come back or not move on? I think it's worth at least asking that question to those who believe in it. The six most commonly believed reasons that ghosts exist is, one, they don't want to leave because they're too attached to the living. They don't want to cross into the other side if their loved ones are left on earth. They'd rather just haunt them. 
Kind of creepy. Um, number two, they aren't released by the surviving living ones that are on earth. In fact, some of these experts will tell you that you need to release the spirit of those who is still in your presence for whatever reason, and that the living can some way, somehow, keep them from crossing into the other side. Uh, the third is that they've experienced a sudden or tragic death. So, and this is one of my favorites, and it's funny, but there's, believe me, there are people that believe this. Death happens so out of the blue that the spirits are confused and therefore don't cross on the other side because they're like, where am I going? Where am I going? I don't even know what just happened, right? Which I think is kind of funny, but people do believe that. That that is so unexpected that they just don't know what's going on. Now, again, numbers four, five, and six make a little more sense to me, uh, but maybe it's because they've been made into good TV shows and movies. Number four, to protect or warn loved ones. This is Patrick Swayze visiting his wife, played by Demi Moore, right? To protect and warn loved ones, they hang around so that their loved ones who are still living don't fall into some type of harm. Number five is so that they may tend to unfinished business. This is, of course, Bruce Willis in The Sixth Sense, or, or Jennifer Love Hewitt's character in The Ghost Whisperer, who's communicating with the dead and trying to provide them some type of closure before they can cross over. And then the sixth, and this is great, to avoid judgment. Uh, Sylvia Brown, actually, the, the lady uh, from the Montel Williams show, actually believes that some spirits understand that if they were to cross over, they sit in God's presence and they aren't real sure as to how that's going to go. And so they just decide to stay on this side because they aren't real sure how that whole judgment process is going to happen. I, I think it's um, an interesting theory um, and it makes sense. If you think that's not going to go well, you may want to hang around for a little longer. But that is at least a commonly held belief among those who believe in the paranormal and really seek the counsel of those um, as to why ghosts come back or don't move on. There's a key point to remember in all this, and I, I don't want to mistake this, but none of our culture's beliefs about ghosts are found or supported by scripture. I've just listed all sorts of reasons why it might be becoming more interesting. I've listed reasons why those who are ex experts or so-called experts in the field believe they hang around or come back to visit, but nothing that I've shared with you so far is found or supported in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. So rather than spend all morning and really all your life allowing movies, television shows, and experts like John Edward Charmar Golis or Sylvia Brown to tell you what to believe about the paranormal, this morning I'd like to share what the Bible teaches about these things. And as I've done research this week, I feel like I've found four truths found in Scripture that speak directly to this phenomenon of ghost, the supernatural, and the paranormal. The first truth I found was this. Deceased humans are not and do not become ghosts. This is supported in Scripture in a few different places, but I'd like to address this from both a believer's and an unbeliever's standpoint. At death, the believer's spirit departs from the physical body and goes into the presence of the Lord in heaven. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, Paul writes, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. So he understands either I'm here on earth doing fruitful labor for the Lord, or I've died and I have joined the presence of my creator. In Acts chapter 7, you guys know that Stephen, the martyr recorded there in the seventh chapter of Acts, is being stoned to death. And one of the last things that he's recorded is saying, in fact, the last thing, that he's recorded as saying is, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, with this understanding that as he drew his last breath, his next breath or his next moment would be in the presence of the Lord. The Old Testament tells us in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, that the dust returns to the ground it came from and the spirit returns to God who gave it, which is why it's very appropriate in a funeral or memorial service that we bury our loved ones and we understand that their spirit is not in the casket or in the grave or has not been cremated. The spirit joined the Lord at the moment that that body was no longer needed on this earth. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5 is a great chapter to look at regarding this entire subject. I would encourage you just to jot down 2 Corinthians 5. It goes into great detail in describing the difference between our earthly and our heavenly bodies. In the NIV, it, re it refers to our bodies as tents uh, that we inhabit or that we live in. Verse 8 specifically in that chapter tells us that to be away from our earthly bodies is to be at home with the Lord. So we're either away or we're at home. And that doesn't leave a lot of space in between. So that's the believers. As we address the unbelievers for a second, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 tells us that for those who have not accepted the gift of salvation that comes through faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, their spirits will be, quote, held for the day of judgment. Now, setting aside some healthy and spirited disagreement on hell and how that whole thing works out, all Christians can agree that our souls upon death are held by our Creator and not free to move about the earth. We are either here or we are there. And we are there, we are in God's hands and ultimately subject to God's judgment. So that's the first spiritual truth. The deceased humans are not and do not become ghosts. Two, spiritual warfare. This idea of angels versus demons is real. It's not some biblical term made up to describe some modern phenomenon of when things go bad it's always demons and when things go good it's always angels. Spiritual warfare is a real thing. It's something that happens in a realm that is unseen and oftentimes misunderstood or not understood at all. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 Paul writes that our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Both 1 John chapter 4 and 1 Timothy chapter 4 warn us that these dark unseen forces have great powers and constantly work to deceive us. Now think about that. That's where this sermon gets spooky. And that's where last week's sermon gets a little spooky. The fact that the Bible is so clear on the fact that this idea of angels and demons is real and that it is a spiritual realm that we cannot control in a spiritual realm that we cannot oftentimes see or even understand doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's there, and Satan and his army of demons are constantly working, as the New Testament describes, to deceive and to destroy us. And they have powers. Satan has power in this world to do things that harm us, that keep us from being the best that we can be, and really, most importantly, from being the best we can in showing God to the world in portraying God to the world, in being Jesus with skin on, as, as one uh, very popular pastor likes to put it. When we're going about trying to witness to the world, demons and Satan are celebrating at every misstep, at every time that we fall into sin, at every struggle, at every discouragement we have. It is a commonly held belief among many evangelicals that these dark forces or demons are to blame, oftentimes, for what others may call ghostly hauntings. They'd like us to believe that ghosts are coming back because that takes us away from what Scripture teaches about how God watches over us and protects us and will not let things harm us. So the second particular truth was that spiritual warfare is real. The third truth I found is that God forbids all forms of occultism. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 13, Israel is preparing uh, to take into a new country, the promised land, and, and they're going to enter a place that God has basically given them victory and said, this is your new home, but God has a warning for them before they inhabit this place. He says, when you enter the land the Lord is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. So thinking about the New Testament warnings of how powerful those dark forces are and the Old Testament legal condemnation of embracing and engaging those dark forces, we can be sure that God's word is both consistent and clear on this topic. We should not entertain any forms of the paranormal as legitimate, useful, or permissible in our lives. I believe that it is both dangerous to open ourselves up to demonic influence, 
and offensive to our Lord who has promised to care for our every need. Now think about that for a second. As I was doing research this week and, and reading about some of these guys who claim to have the power to consult with those on the other side, even they, and it makes a little sense for a couple reasons, they will warn you that if you do not have the training or you do not have the gift, do not try this at home. Okay, now there's a couple reasons. Obviously, one, they want you to pay them to do that, so it makes sense for them financially. But also, they say, do not try this at home because if you open yourselves up to these powers, this spiritual realm that they claim gives them some type of insight or ability to communicate and bring messages back and forth, you're basically saying, all right, Satan, show me what kind of power you have. And in doing that, you open yourself up from being misused, abused, and confused about what you may encounter. You know, in no time in my research this week or in reading through scripture about this, did I get the, in, did I get the impression that some of this stuff isn't possible. Okay? At no time did I, did, I, did I read something that says every haunting you've ever heard of, Nathan, is total bogus. It has some totally realistic, explainable uh, reason for it. You know, the reason that door slams, even though there's no wind, there's no air, it, it, it's just, there's something else, you know, a, a kid's pulling a string or something, whatever it might be. Um, what I read in Scripture is that there are some things that we can't explain, and oftentimes there are unexplainable and unseen reasons and explanations for how those things happen. And so when we open ourselves up to trying to get into that world or understand that darkness, that deepness, we actually put ourselves in a very dangerous position. Um, and some of those experts, again, would tell you that that's not a place you want to be. Proceed with caution. So if those who are outside of the faith are telling me inside the faith to proceed with caution and I look at scripture and it tells, it tells me don't proceed at all, I think I have a pretty good idea as to where God is on this particular topic. Nathan, it's not for you to engage with ghosts or psychics or mediums or tarot cards or Ouija boards or whatever it might be to try and do some of those things that we might have the desire to do and the reasons for communicating or opening ourselves up uh, to being involved with those types of different things. And I believe it is offensive to God because God tells us that he is everything that we need. God tells us in scripture that if we have questions, we are to ask him those questions. God never promises that every question you'll ever ask is going to be answered, at least not on this earth. You know, the advice that I was given a long time ago that I think is great advice to be given is that if you have a question about something, you think God's the only one that knows the answer, pray about it. That's, that's a great thing to do. Well, if you wake up tomorrow morning and you don't have a good idea as to what the answer is to your prayer, then today, pray about it again. And tomorrow, pray about it again. And the next day, pray about it again. I've talked to a lot of people who have prayed over things for many days, weeks, years. Sometimes they get the answer to those prayers. Other times they breathe their last breath, never getting the, the cookie cutter or black and white answer to whatever that difficult question or in their mind, simple question might have been. You know, my thought is if we keep asking the question, we're going to get to a point one day when we're sitting face to face with God and he's going to have no choice but to answer us. Well, I, I don't want to speak for God. He has a choice, but at least we're right there in communication and conversation. Right? I would much rather be the one that continues to pursue those answers from God and through God than looking elsewhere. James actually speaks to this in chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. He says, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. Now think about how that verse plays out in what I just discussed. You have a question, you're a church-going person, or you know someone who's a church-going person, you go to church for the answer, look at scripture for the answer, ask others who claim to be Christian or relationship with God for the answer, and they can't give it to you. And so you decide to seek an answer from elsewhere. God says he's not interested in divided loyalty. He's not interested in being one of three or four different places you go looking for answers. God would like to be the source for all of your questions and all of your answers. And when we split and divide our loyalty, we can basically write off the possibility that God's going to answer that. Because as it says, such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. This sermon series has the potential to be very, very spooky. I know Corey mentioned last week as he was teaching on demons just 
kind of getting the chills a few times during the week. As I knew I was preparing for this sermon, Tuesday night we had band practice and, and Corey's wife Jennifer led worship for us this morning at 9.30. Um, she was going to be the worship leader for the morning, so she sang three of the four songs. And, um, and that was good because my voice was kind of starting to sound kind of funny. And by the end of it, I had kind of powered through and had this really deep, like very hoarse voice. And you put me with, in front of a microphone, I'm going to make funny noises anyways. But when I have a really deep, like Darth Vader voice or, you know, uh, I'm just going to have fun. And so I sang songs like in a real bass tone. Um, but but the, I just figured, oh, I'm just getting hoarse. No big deal. Well, then Wednesday, I woke up, and I could barely talk. And I realized I had youth that night and other things going on that day. Thursday, I felt terrible and had the same voice. Had to take Zeke to a couple different places. Friday, I started feeling better. My voice has still been like this. Well, yesterday was of my own doing. I got tickets to go to the Tech TCU game. So screaming at that obviously I didn't do much good but it's funny because when given the opportunity to speak truth I see some of these things kind of coming and happening and it's almost like somebody wants to keep me quiet and, and I'll be honest with you I'm not gonna blame my voice or this viral infection that the doctor told me I had on Wednesday on demons you know I'm, I'm not gonna do that but I do know that whether they're responsible or not they're celebrating every time that I'm doubting whether or not I can be here this morning that they are absolutely jumping for joy at any doubts that I might have that I can properly prepare or deliver a sermon on such a key and important topic in our society and our world today. It's a spooky thing because when you lay in bed at night and you start to think back to week one of the series, week two of the series, my second truth found in scripture today that spiritual warfare is real, you might close your eyes and think, are there angels and demons in my room right now? Is there, is, there, is there a battle going on right now that I don't know about? You know, you may be one that, that likes ghost stories or, or books or movies about it, and yet you wake up in a cold sweat at night because that nightmare that, that plays off of one of those things you've opened yourself up to uh, gets you thinking, oh my gosh, what could really be out there? It has the possibility of becoming a very spooky thing in your life, and yet this morning I don't want to leave you in a moment of fear. I don't want to believe you with this, this whole perception or this attitude that, Man, do I need to be on the lookout? I believe with confidence this. I believe that no matter what battle is being fought in the unseen spiritual realm, and no matter what schemes Satan and his army of demons are employing to deceive and destroy us, our God, my God, is always present with us and will always be more powerful than any dark forces. I believe that with all my heart. If I get spooked by a demon, if I get spooked by the thought of a demon or even the celebration of a demon at one of my uh, struggles, I know that my God is present and my God is stronger, my God is mighty, and my God will win in the end. I'd like to close by reading you Psalm 121 because, as I said, as a, this, this can get spooky and it can cause us to doubt, it can cause us to worry, it can cause us to wonder. And yet I find a lot of peace and confidence and calm in the words of this psalmist. Will you read this with me? I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not stumble. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father God, as we look to your word for some guidance in how we can interact and engage with those who uh, may be fascinated or even captivated by this thought of, of communicating uh, with deceased loved ones, God, who, who feel as though they may be haunted or a place that they are as haunted, God. Um, not those that, that want to just make a buck off of it, God, but those who are really struggling. Um, I pray that you would give us a confidence in knowing that your Bible does, uh, that your word does speak to this, that we can have confidence in knowing that you are in control, God, that, uh, that you hold our souls um, firmly within your grasp, uh, that outside of what's going on in spiritual warfare, angels and demons, God, there's nothing that Satan or his army of demons can do to captivate our souls, um, God, because they are held firmly in your hands. 
Lord, give us the peace to know uh, that you have called us to this place for an amazing reason. Give us the awareness of, of understanding what people may be thinking and, and wondering about, especially during this Halloween time and this season, God. Um, let us not be scared um, or even judgmental of those, God. That's not what you've called us to be. But Lord, just let us be a beacon of light into a place of darkness um, and just love us through it. We thank you so much. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.